Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, how are you? Good, I hope. If not, well, that sucks. No, it, if not, you're, you'll be okay. All right, I, why am I starting like that? I don't know. Um, so I watched a really funny video. I won't go into it. Uh, it was the, the Australian puppet. I just watched it. Anyways, my million miles a second, my mouth's going right now. My, my brain is going, Jesus Christ, start the video before I say anything else stupid. Original link to the video, top of the description. Thanks, I think it was Mel um, from the Discord who gave me the recommendation. Link to the Discord below. We'd love to have you. Front. You had to be alert Sorry. for... As a I said this in the sniper video. It just... But uh, apparently they were doing this. I, I said they should... Stop, just play the video. As a soldier in the trenches of the Western Front, you had to be alert for many things. For snipers, for enemy aircraft, for sudden offensives, for artillery, but you also had to be alert for danger from below. And this is not new to World War I, right? They've been doing this for a long time. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about mining and tunneling in the Great War. Because of the static nature of the war on the Western Front, the majority of mining and tunneling done in the war was done there. That front spanned a thousand kilometers from the North Sea to the Swiss border and did not drastically change from the fall of 1914 until late in the war. The time that both sides spent in pretty much the same positions meant time to construct complex defenses, and that included complex networks of mines and tunnels. Mining contributed to the shelter and transport of troops, provided cover for supply and communications, and enabled armies to undermine enemy defense. Guys, I just had to close some things. I just, it only took like five provided seconds. Provided cover for supply and communications and enabled armies to undermine enemy defenses and to destroy or compromise them. Early in the war, mining operations were rudimentary and were precursors to an attack. Like in 1914, when the Germans dug shallow tunnels at Givenchy Le La Basse and laid eight 50 kilo mines beneath the positions of the Indian Sirhin Brigade. They blew the mines in December and the following infantry attack took out a company of 800 men. In 1914, the British Expeditionary oh, the, Force okay. did not have any mining companies, but Major Sir John Norton Griffiths, also an MP, who had once managed a gold mine in the Transvaal, proposed the deployment of civilian miners to the front. See, at that time, he had contracts for digging sewers in Manchester and Liverpool, where the miners used a technique called clay kicking, and he figured this would be really effective in regions where the earth is made up of clay, like in Flanders. Clay kicking used a three-man team composed of a kicker who sat with his back against a wooden support and dug out the clay by kicking a spade-like tool at the rock face. He would pass the spoil to a bagger who would in turn pass it to a trammer who took it out of the mine and brought back supplies. By February 1915, some of Norton Griffith's civilian engineers were already underground in Flanders. The Germans did not know of clay kicking and used Maddox for digging, which was noisier and a lot slower. Clay kicking teams could dig an average of eight meters per day, the Germans two. By that month, the British Army already had eight tunneling companies, but by mid-1916 would have 31, with 21,000 tunnelers and 50,000 attached infantry working on projects on the Western Front. Both sides soon developed countermining techniques. Initially, this was simple listening devices like filling oil drums with water and checking for vibrations or, or putting a stick into the ground and gripping it with your teeth to check for them. But this That's interesting. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, for like any parts that you think are going to be m like really loud and, and there's a greater chance that the enemy might pick it up, would you like start a gunfight if they're like if it was too quiet just so that any noise that they that the other that the enemy hears that's really the mining it, they they don't know that they might contribute it to artillery or or gunfire noise this became more complex as well. Stethoscopes and eventually geophones were used that could detect noises in the ground up to 50 meters away. The geophone actually developed to the point where just two listeners could man three dozen sensors over a large area and even determine the direction the enemy was moving. 
Opposing tunnels, as you may guess, would sometimes converge, leading to underground skirmishes. That's Rifles crazy. were impractical underground, so mine freaking nuts. Imagine that for a second. You're already doing this insanely dangerous thing. Probably uh, chance of death, probably high even without doing that. And something falls down and it's you just hear like the, a different language and oh my god, that's terrifying. There's tunnel rats. Viet different story. Vietnam Sorry. Verge, leading to underground skirmishes. Rifles were impractical underground, so miners fought with their tools or improvised weapons. But if you detected an enemy tunnel, you really wanted to disrupt or destroy it without giving away your own positions. Camouflets, small pre-prepared explosive charges, were directed in the direction of enemy mining to either cause cave-ins or cracks in the area, making further progress perilous or impossible. Okay, it was pretty perilous in general. The miners worked 6 to 12 hour shifts in cramped conditions, often in water, and were afflicted by the same fatigue, trench foot, and illnesses as the surface soldiers, but also had to contend with cave-ins, entombment, gas. Guys, there has to be, I've never been in wartime, I, I have to say this every time because I think it's important to point out, I don't know, I have never been in anything close, not even like training army, never held a gun, I don't know, but I imagine there's got to be a switch in how people act when they're in obvious dangerous scenarios like wartime, where in non-wartime, where it's less likely that you're dying and the stakes aren't as high, you're, you're, you not wanting to do things that could easily get you killed is, is going to be much less. But in a time like this, there has to be, like, although it's really dangerous, it's like, it's war. And so I'm just, I'm curious how the mind, the mind approaches danger in wartime compared to not. Does that make sense? Because something's got to happen. Uh, water and were afflicted by the same fatigue, trench foot, and illnesses as the surface soldiers, but also had to contend with cave-ins, entombment, gas, asphyxiation, drowning, and so forth. They did get paid six shillings a day, which was around six times as much as a frontline private, and this caused some animosity between the two. It didn't help that soldiers in the trenches were exposed to additional dangers themselves when mining and countermining was going on below them. And if the enemy located your tunnels, that meant extra artillery shelling on the men above. So was Other there than just blowing to get up enemy positions, positions, mines could be used to throw up bridges to screen positions, provide cover, or, or stun the enemy just before an advance. At the Somme, the British dug 32 kilometers before the battle there. The largest works were at Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt, a gallery 17 meters below the surface, filled with 18.4 tons of explosives. It was interesting in the sniping video, uh, the snipers of World War One from the Great War channel, same channel, um, that soldiers would like not like the snipers coming around because although they would be able to return fire at other snipers that are causing the men to be super paranoid, rightfully, they would they would essentially show up, the sniper teams do their stuff, might be effective, and then leave. And then the people there would kind of not like that because they just came and then left, and now they're getting a bunch more fire back because of that and so it, it, they felt like they weren't facing the consequences of their own job and i sort of understand that because a sniper's job seemed to be much more favorable to a regular soldier's job at least from what i could tell but in this circumstance where there it's kind of the same concept but a little different is that yeah i, I understand that they're going to return fire and stuff but i do not envy them like i might a sniper you know, who gets to like go around and, and uh, so I, I, I don't understand that animosity is like, yeah, but they're underground. Like, would you rather do that? I, I, I don't know. This 15 meters below the surface, just before an advance. Let me go back like this. On the men above. 
other than just blowing up enemy positions, mines could be used to throw up bridges to screen positions, provide cover, or, or stun the enemy just before an advance. At the Somme, the British dug 32 kilometers before the battle there. The largest works were at Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt, a gallery 17 meters below the surface, filled with 18.4 tons of explosives. This was blown 10 minutes before the zero hour assault and was supposed to disrupt the German positions and allow the British to consolidate good positions at the crest of the blast crater. But instead, it prompted a German counter barrage and alerted the Germans to the impending attack. At Arras, there was intense mining, with the British, French, and Germans blowing 150 charges on a seven-kilometer front between October 1915 and April 1917. One reason for the heavy activity there was that, unlike Belgium, the ground under Arras is made of chalk, which is relatively easy to dig through, but is also stable and easy to support. Since that sector was pretty quiet the first half of the war, the Germans had built an extensive mining network there. When the British took over the sector of front opposite them, they immediately brought in seven tunneling companies. And by 1917, a lot of the front was defined by 19 crater groups separating the enemy positions. By April 1917, when the Battle of Arras began, the expanded British network could hold 24,000 men and had kitchens, latrines, and medical facilities, all with electric lighting. At Vimy, 12 kilometers of subways had been built to carry the men right up to the front in secret. The most famous mining operation of the war, though, was at Messines Ridge. The earth there is mostly made up of clay, but the surface and subsoil includes Kemmel sands, which is like quicksand and made mining there really susceptible to flooding and cave-ins, especially on the high ground held by the Germans. British miners solved this problem by sinking mine shafts deep below the sands, 18 to 27 meters down, and then extending tunnels from the shafts. They were doing this for a full year before the Germans started Started doing the same process, so British works were more developed. In March 1916, British, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand mining companies began digging the Berlin Tunnel. Wait, so that that makes it seem like encountering another tunnel, like from the enemy, and a fight going on, would be even more or less likely, B because not only do you have to cross each other on the same section, which makes more sense, but you have to be on, on the same. Uh, depth. An enormous system, Australian and New Zealand mining companies began digging the Berlin Tunnel, an enormous system aimed at undermining the whole of German-held Messines Ridge. Despite the extent of the operations and the 15 months it was under construction, the Germans failed to detect it for the most part. When it was completed, it was packed with 600 tons of explosives. At 3.10 a.m. on June 7, 1917, the mines were blown, causing a titanic explosion that pretty much blew the whole ridge into the air, leaving 19 immense craters. An estimated 10,000 Germans were killed, and the blast could reportedly be heard as far away as Dublin. What? How big is that explosion? Like compare it to like a nuclear bomb, like Hiroshima or something like that. 10,000 Germans, because earlier, uh, I was gonna pause, I heard like 900 soldiers killed in one of these earlier examples of tunnels, but it, in the Indian regiment, with it, but it seemed like it was more the casualties came from the charge afterwards from soldiers, and the casualties came from the soldiers. But here, that's 10,000 Germans killed in the explosion. Just the explosion. Man, so that worked. Be because uh, when I'm trying to I think of, of, like, how I'd want to build these things, uh, obviously, like, it'd be so great. It, it'd be great to get any damage, but to get go deep enough or like have pretty much unscathed tunneling to the place and getting a giant amount of explosives before being uh picked up noticed and clearly this was just best case scenario um and you could hear it in dublin i have nothing else to compare that to i, d I don't know how far away you could hear the hiroshima explosion um but if 10,000 people were killed and you blew up a hill with one... Four of the mines... 
How many tons of explosives? Were blown at Spark. When it was completed, it was packed with 600 tons of. How many blue whales of, of tons is that? How big is a blue whale? 150 tons, I think. So that's like four blue whales worth of explosives. That's my uh, metric use. Of explosives. Four blue whales. At 310 AM on June 7th, 1917, the mines were blown, causing a titanic explosion that pretty much blew the whole ridge into the air, leaving 19 immense craters. An estimated 10,000 Germans were killed, and the blast could reportedly be heard as far away as Dublin. Four of the mines were left undetonated, and one of them actually blew in 1955 when it was hit by lightning, killing a nearby cow who still counts as a World War I casualty. Really? As the final stages of the war Mr. ended Cow. the stalemate in the West, tunneling that required months of planning and work was no longer viable. And the last deep mine of the war there was detonated at Givenchy, August 10th, 1917. Is that all barbed wire? Is all of this barbed wire? When I normally think of barbed wire, is it Constantine wire? Isn't that another word for it? Whatever, barbed wire. I, I think of like the outside of prisons with the big like circular barbed wires or something or some government complex that you don't want people bringing into. But this just seems like a forest of barbed wire. If it is barbed wire. I mean, I, I can't think of anything else it would be. Deep mine of the is that like a flag that got caught in the wind and the barbed wire? War there was detonated at Givenchy, August 10th, 1917. But tunneling was not confined to the Western Front. There was extensive mining by both sides in the Dolomites on the Italian Front. Mining there meant drilling through solid rock and even ice and was skilled labor that was also very dangerous. It was used to build protection, but also for offense. 34 mines were blown on that front between January 1916 and March 1918, the largest being by the Austrians at Pasubio, which destroyed its north face and caused casualties on both sides. However, though mining was not solely on the Western Front, the innovation there, the complexity of the tunnels, and the sheer magnitude of the explosions was centered there. You can still see the impact on the landscape today in France and Belgium, and even visit some of the craters left behind from explosions. On that front, the work of the miners was certainly tough and dangerous, but it was undoubtedly... If these are this big now, how big were they originally? On that front, the work of the miners was certainly tough and dangerous, but it was undoubtedly essential work as both sides strove to gain any advantage during those years of bloody stalemate. And now for something completely different. I want to take the time to recommend a great new World War I podcast by our friends from the World War I Centennial Commission. You can find a link in the description or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to learn more about the Battle of Messine Ridge, you can click right here for our episode about that. And like us on Facebook, follow British us on Path. Twitter to learn even more about the First World War. See you next time. British Path is such a great channel. And now for something... Uh, great video as always. Indy's awesome. Great war. Awesome channel. I, the more I learn about World War I, I find out the more I love it over World War II. I loved... Like, growing... I love, like... I've always loved like nature documentaries, animal documentaries, and history documentaries. And the amount of World War II documentaries I've seen just out of curiosity is very large, I think, just over a long period of time. And I always loved learning about World War II. But the more I learn about World War I, the more I think it is so much more fascinating than World War II, mainly because... Why did I do this? Because... It's like the first, I want to use the word cool, but I know in talking about cool and, and like a disastrous, deadly millions of people die is very off-putting and I get that, but it's the best word I can use in in describing it, it, so many, it seems like like World War II was like a part two to World War One, in not just like, in not just like politics and and. and and like, and it was related in a lot of political ways and stuff, but that it seems like World War I was the start of this massive, like, 
Industrial Revolution gave rise to the ability and better uh, technology and, and weaponry. And it just seems like it's the first time where in the modern day with modern stuff that we were killing each other with. And it sounds really psychotic to say that's cool. It's, that's not cool, but the, but the World War I, I'm, I'm not saying what I'm trying to say. Do you get what I mean? Please, uh, just it, it. We just like found so many new ways to kill each other with these so many new things that we could kill each other with, and it, it's just fascinating and terrifying. Obviously, I'm not saying it's not terrifying, but I, I don't watch it because I want to. Like, I don't watch and learn about this stuff because it's terrifying. I learn about it because it's fascinating. And uh, World War One is just so many layers more fascinating to me the more I learn about it, than World War II. Hope that makes sense, and I hope I didn't sound too crazy or stupid there. If I did, then, you know, correct me down in the comments below. Love you all. Hope you're all doing, doing well. Would love if you liked and subscribed. Hope you do. Completely free. And hopefully I will see you guys next video. Bye, guys.